my creative energy is what I bring to the table. And if I'm not protecting it, it's leaking. And when it comes time for me to have to be on, to, to do a podcast or to do an Instagram live or to do whatever, a photo shoot, I'm gonna be worthless if I haven't protected that. Welcome to today's episode. I'm so excited because when I bring somebody on, it's because I want to learn from them. I want to make sure my entire audience knows about them and they're a part of their ecosystem. Today I have for you the founder of Simplified. She is the creator of the Simplified Planner. She's a mom of three ages 12 and eight year old twins. She's a best selling author. Get this nine times. Okay. And she's the host of the simplified podcast. So please help me welcome Emily lay to the show. Hi, uh, Emily. I am so excited you're here because you have been on an eight week sabbatical, right? I have. I'm today, as we record this, I'm back on day two. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. So tell me about that. Like, so when I say an eight week sabbatical, you guys, she took eight weeks off of work and yeah. social media. So yep. tell me, Emily, what inspired you to, you know, do the sabbatical? Yeah. Well, I started my company 15 years ago. And apart from very short maternity leaves, I have not had time away from work really at all. Because as you know, as an entrepreneur, it kind of goes with you everywhere. Mm -hmm. It goes on vacation with you. You take it in, you know, to bed, like you, you think about it in your sleep. I mean, I love my job so much, but I actually have a good friend who is a priest and he took a sabbatical, which is fairly standard, I think, in that profession to every yes. couple of years take a sabbatical. And it was him. He, he was talking about his sabbatical and everything he had learned during his time away. And I thought, that's such a cool idea. And I felt like I, I was at a place where I needed to get some clarity about what was next. And I wanted to give some more responsibility over to the nine very talented, capable women that I work with. And it just, I don't know, it just felt like the right time. So yeah, I took all of February and all of March away from social media, away from my email. It was hard at first and it was amazing. It was really nice. Okay. So what was the reaction when you went in to tell your nine teammates, basically, hey, I'm going to take eight weeks off. How did they take it? They loved it. In fact, <laughs> they were part of the conversation. We had a big brainstorming, like they're all remote. So we had a big in-person, almost like a retreat of sorts to kind of work on the next phase of our business and a, sort of a rebrand we have coming up. And I kind of mentioned something about it and they were like, you should, you've been doing this for so long and we, we got you, we got this, we want to support you in it. And so they're just, they're remarkable people and they just took it and ran with it and they did a phenomenal job while I was out. I love that because it, it gave them an opportunity to shine, right? Yeah. While you were away and really show off probably some things that maybe they couldn't when you were full yeah. in it. Yeah. And it also like, how amazing is it that God has supported you with such mm -hmm. awesome people that you could truly take time off? Sincerely. Yeah, for sure. This is piquing my interest because I want to, I want to get into the sabbatical more, but now this is taking yeah. me another place. How did you find these amazing people? Because when you're scaling a business, I think, you know, team is everything. You know, it really is. And it is not easy for me to delegate because I, it's my baby. I, you know, I, I started this thing from my guest room with literally nothing to put into it. But it, when I just got, you know, multiple times to a place where my plate was too full and I knew that it was really a disservice to the brand for me to try to continue doing it all by myself. I also kind of started to realize I'm, I'm good at certain things. There are certain things that I bring to the table for our company, but wouldn't it be great if someone had a skill set that wasn't like mine, that was completely different, and then they could bring something great? So it's Simplified has grown to places that I would have never even dreamed it would go because we we have like we have an artist on staff who is can paint these incredible, you know, pieces of artwork. We have someone who does logistics. It's like another side of my brain that I don't know how to use. Just all sorts of people who are so good at individual things. 
How did I find them? Almost all of them via social media. One of them was a, a good friend of ours in Tampa when we used to live there. She was one of my first friends that I made down there, and she's still with us today. She used to help me. Her name is Dusty. She used to help me pack boxes in my living room when Aww. that was the case. And then my sister-in-law works with us too. But they, I always say when you're hiring someone, I personally believe in hiring for character and integrity above resume and skill set. There's a lot of things that you can teach someone, but you can't teach character and integrity. And especially with a remote setup and an entrepreneurial type of a company, I mean, we have to be able to pivot quickly. We have to be able to do, I mean... In 2020, when everyone's plans got canceled and we made planners for a living, we had to pivot, you know? So um, I just believe in hiring in hiring people you want to be around. And they're just, they are. They're, they're just awesome people. That's amazing. I love that. I always say that I hire for character over skill too. Yeah. So I yeah. love that you're confirming that. So yeah. going back to, let's talk week one of this sabbatical. I'm so interested in it because you're probably going to inspire me to do it. <laughs> honestly. Uh, but week one, was it hard? Like, I know it had to be hard to like actually stop thinking about the business. What did that look like for you? Yeah, it was hard. And I'm not sure I ever stopped thinking about it, but I was able to stop the wheel spinning in my head a little bit and hop off that hamster wheel of like productivity. The first week I deleted social media off my phone. I did a good job in advance of the sabbatical. Like meeting with all of our partners, people that I work with, my publisher, you know, my podcast producers, getting everybody set up so they understood what was happening and where I'd be and, you know, that I'd be back. And the first week I slept, I probably slept 15 hours a day. My husband was even like, are you okay? <laughs> I feel like you're getting sick or something. And I was like, I think my body is in recovery. Like it is recovering from the past 15 years of just nonstop. If I'm not moving and working, I'm thinking about it. I kind of thought like, am I going to sleep the whole eight weeks? I did not sleep the whole eight weeks. I ended up um, taking piano lessons and that was something I'd never done before. I spent a lot of time cooking, which I usually don't enjoy, but I did. And just like reading and hanging out with my family. It was, it was, oh, it was so good. It was such a privilege. I realized it's not something everyone gets, you know, gets to do, but it was wonderful. Well, you, you deserve that time. I mean, you did work hard for 15 years to not be an employee in your business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So like you get that opportunity and I am so happy you got that. I think that like now, uh, there are people listening in that go, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing, but right. they're not at, like, they're not at that luxury of being able to, maybe they don't have a team yet. Maybe they're, you know, just getting started in right. their, you know, entrepreneur journey. What would you tell those people? Because it sounded like you're, you know, you're like, I was in recovery. Like most yeah. people are tired because it's that joke that says like, Hey, I quit my nine to five to go <laughs> work 80 hours a week for myself. And, and that's the truth, you know? So it always makes me laugh. <laughs> when yeah, people like, I know. I get my time back. You eventually do. Right. But it's like, you have to build the systems and you got to get the right team in place. So yeah. what would you tell those people that are listening in maybe in the beginning stages how do they kind of take a mini sabbatical while still, you know, making sure their business is running? They're the solo person right now. I think it's a couple of things. I think number one, I always think about this verse from Ecclesiastes that talks about there's a time and a season for everything. There's a time to plant, there's a time to grow, a time to live, a time to die. Like I have to think about my life and my work life in seasons. Like there was a season where I... I didn't sleep. Like I was working until 3 a.m., getting up at 6, going to my actual job to bring a paycheck. And, you know, that was just the season I was in. I had to hustle. I had to work so hard. And it wouldn't be what it is today if it weren't for that. So I don't think you can, you can build something, unless you're just really lucky. I don't think you can build something sustainable and worthwhile if you're not putting in the hard work on the front end. That being said, that's not sustainable. For me, I've had a few like crash and burn moments over the years where I've spread myself way too thin, said yes to way too many things, and I have to kind of stop and reevaluate and pull back. And I think it's important to honor the seasons of rest that come when things are going great, when you have employees and you have, you know, uh, some automation in place where you can step back. 
But I also think there's this pressure as an entrepreneurial woman to be constantly on, especially with social media. And I wouldn't have a company if it weren't for social media, so I can't make it the bad guy. But we can be constantly spinning our wheels, like constantly posting, constantly sharing, constantly on. And that's just, it's just not healthy at all. So if you can take a social media free weekend, if you can delete your apps for the weekend, if you can take an afternoon off, go do something that fills you up. And if you're like me, you're like, okay, Emily, work fills me up. I love my job. Me too. It totally fills me up. I love it. But there's other things too that protect my creative energy more. That was probably my biggest lesson of my sabbatical was that my creative energy is what I bring to the table. And if I'm not protecting it, it's leaking. And when it comes time for me to have to be on to to do a podcast or to do an Instagram live or to do whatever, a photo shoot, I'm going to not, I'm going to be worthless if I haven't protected that. So it's important to remember that you are the asset and that you have to protect it. Oh my gosh. Yes. You guys need to write that down. You are the asset. You need to protect it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what did you have to have in place in your business before you took those eight weeks off? I didn't know I was going to take a sabbatical until probably late last year. So probably three or four months in advance. But about a year before that, I knew something was shifting in the business and I couldn't run the business like the day to day and also be the face of the business that I needed to separate the two. And we had a woman on our team named Brittany who has been with me forever and she's phenomenally gifted in like operations and logistics and things that evade my brain. So we promoted her to COO and over the the next year, she took over that role really well and allowed me to kind of step back. So I think it was kind of a long time running. That being said, I have talked to multiple people lately who are like, you know what? I'm thinking about taking a sabbatical and they don't have that in place. They're just literally going to put things on pause so that they can give themselves some time to rest and come back with more clarity. And I think that's possible too. You know, I I did tactical things like I had an out of office saying, you know, who to contact for certain things. And I got everybody prepped for what they needed. I made sure I didn't have any crazy deadlines happening before or after. But I think if it's important to you, you'll make it happen. You know? Absolutely. I love the tip about doing social media free weekends. And I love that you had somebody already on your team that you gave the opportunity to rise up. You yeah. and really shine and show you yeah. like, okay, she was going to be able to make everything run. She's also the mom of triplet babies and an older child. So she has okay, a, yeah. a son who's five and triplet one-year-olds. I mean, she's, like, she's amazing. Yeah. I want to hire her. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can't have her. Like, where right. can I find another one like her? I know. You know it's, it's so interesting that you brought up that she's an older child because- it's so, I read this book by Chris Voss. It's, I forget what it's about negotiations though. Yeah. And they only hire, he, he worked for the FBI and he was saying that they only like hire based off of birth order. And really? For like the negotiations team. Yeah. Wow. Because that's it, fascinating. I know. And then I, I really like got in into it because I was like, wow, I want to see like what's happening with each of my kids. And it's that's so, so crazy. Like every one of them really fit the prototype. Yeah. <laughs> of like, Oldest, middle, youngest. Yep. Because I have three too. And uh, <laughs> I was like, God knows exactly, you know, what you need when he gives you your children, like at each yeah. time. Yeah. And like he makes them perfect for what he's calling them into. Yeah. My 12 year old is like, a, he plays like elite hockey and yeah. he wants to go to a prep school, in Boston or something like that. It scares me. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like my baby in one year, you're going to just, you're going to basically be in college. But he is the person like that has the personality for it. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Well, mine are the same way. It's so true. My old, my oldest uh, is similar. Yeah. <laughs> he would aw. be the negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. So now how did your family like respond to this sabbatical? Did they love it or were they like, okay, yeah. mom, go back to work? What, what happened? <laughs> no, they loved it. I mean, I've, I've always kind of guarded my time in that, like, I always pick my kids up from school. I stop working when they get out of school, you know, now that I have the luxury to do that. But so n- not a ton changed for them. I think my 
demeanor probably changed a little bit. I was a little less frazzled. But they enjoyed it. And we did go away for spring break. We went to Canada and spent some time in Victoria and Salt Spring Island. And so I think me being able to fully unplug on that trip was also fun for them. But my husband was super supportive. He actually, Brian actually does not work for my company. He's an entrepreneur as well. But he stepped in and started participating in finance meetings. It's his skill set. And so he's going to continue doing that. So it's another good thing that came out of it. Yes. It's like family business. You have the sister-in-law. Now you have the husband. That's right. I love it. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Okay. So you've written nine best-selling books. I'm in the process of writing my first one. Oh, that's awesome. You know, I want to hear from you. What is one thing that you, you now having all this experience writing books that you wish you would have known when you were writing your first book? I feel like every book is different for me. Like the first book, book that I wrote, my my twins were brand new. And I wrote it at Starbucks down the street every night between bedtime and the time that Starbucks closed for eight weeks. <laughs> so each book was birthed a little bit differently. Like now they're in school and I can write while they're there. I would say what surprised me the most about writing in general is you write a book. So you pour your heart out on paper and then you finally finish it. And you're like, this is it. I'm done. Goodbye. And there's so much that happens after that. Um, there's so much in terms of like mar- marketing the book. And Glennon Doyle in her book Untamed talks about this and says like, it's so crazy that like I wrote the book and then they want me to like talk about it, but I already wrote it. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was funny. But I, I also realized whatever life lesson I had learned while I was writing or what I was writing about, like Grace Not Perfection was my first one. I would turn it in and be like, okay, lesson learned, like put a bow on that. I'm done. And every single time, I almost have to like remind myself of this every single time when it comes time to market the book and talk about the book and do media and things like that. It's like God pulls me through the lesson again. Like I have to, I have to like remind myself the lesson because somehow I get, I just get pulled right back through it. And it's just a constant reminder that like, we're always learning. We're always growing. You're never really putting a bow on, on a life lesson and, and sending it off. But yeah, I think that would be my biggest takeaway. I love that. Yeah, my manuscript is due in like 30 days. Oh gosh, and, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's still so much to do. But yeah, we yeah. still don't even, like they've, um, the publisher, the way that they bought the book, they now don't like the title. So mm. it's so funny. And I'm like, yeah, how are you guys going to sell this in 30 days? Like they're going to the market or whatever that's called. And I'm like, we need a title. We need a title. And the whole thing that's running in my mind is, is the after part, like, right. Like the, I'm like, the book part is easy. It's now like, how are we going to make sure hundreds of thousands of people buy this book? And yeah. so much of it rides on that title. That happened to me with, with one of my books too. Oh, yeah. really? So mm-hmm. how did you end up coming up with the, with the name? I prefer to start writing with a name, like to have the name already ironed out. And a couple of times I've been able to do that, but one time it was when less becomes more it was my third or fourth book and it's a really special book to me i had a different title and the publisher did not they did not love or one person at the publisher did not love the title and that person's opinion mattered a whole lot so we had to kind of like revisit a few ideas we ended up just kind of like throwing spaghetti at the wall until we found something but What we ended up doing was when less becomes more, like that phrase came out of the manuscript. So it really ended up being like a phrase or words that you pull from what you've already written, you know? That's interesting that you're saying that. That might be confirmation for me because yesterday what was thrown on the table was the title of chapter one. Oh, And I like it a lot. Everybody likes it, but it's like, it's such a 180 to what the original title was that I'm chomping on it. Like, is this what people are going to pick up? Yeah. Ooh, I like it that that's yeah. worked for you. I could see that. I could see that working if it ties in really well. And, you know, and, and the title's one thing, the, the cover, the, the, the book itself, like the words, all of it is also important. I know it all matters. So yeah. your book, Sure as the Sunrise, yep. is adorable. And it's a hundred morning meditations that begin with a scripture. And my faith is like a huge part of my life. And it's like everything to me. So, I love that your book, like it's an easy thing to do in the morning, like read the scripture, you know, 
And then I always like bring that into a team meeting. I'm, I'm, I just can't keep God out of it. I'm like, Oh, you know, right. I'm not that everybody on my team's Christian or anything like that, but I just, I just feel like it always can relate. Like, yeah. you know, there's always something good. And I feel like it always helps everybody have a broader perspective. Like, you know, the thing that we're stressed out about on this team meeting right now is really not that big of a deal yeah. when you have a God size view. So what is your daily practice that brings your faith into the work that you do? I think for so many years, especially with small kids, I would kind of rush out of bed and not have really have much structure to the morning because usually every morning was different and it's kind of unpredictable. Once I got to a place where my kids are a little bit older and we went through COVID stuff like that. Do you remember what those days when everything was like Groundhog's Day over and over and over? I just had this moment. Uh, so we live on Pensacola Bay and every day I walk out of my bedroom and I look out the backyard and over the water, you see the sunrise. And I just had this moment during COVID where I thought, OK, everything around me feels like it's on fire. Like I'm trying to homeschool. I'm trying to run a business from here. I'm trying, I'm worried about my parents because of COVID and the sun came up and I just remember standing there and thinking, God brought the sun up. He, he did it today. He did it every day before today. And he's going to do it tomorrow, even if it's raining. And that's something that I know for sure. So there's a lot of things I don't know for sure, but I know that the sun's going to come up. And so that's for sure is the sunrise. It's also a verse in Lamentations, but that's where the, the sure is the sunrise idea came from. I just had this moment of like, there's a lot that I don't have agency or control over, but I do have control over some things. And one of them is how I start my morning. And so instead of starting my morning frazzled and, you know, trying to find kids shoes and get everybody out the door, maybe I wake up just a little bit earlier and I have a little bit of time with just me and I fill my heart with something I know for sure, you know, and that's something that I can pour out the rest of the day onto the people I love. And also it just sets you up for such a, such a different mindset as you go into whatever is like, you know, lying ahead. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've been in business for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Do you have a story where maybe your faith really guided you through making a very big decision or overcoming Mm -hmm. like a challenge in your business? Yes. 2017. So we started it in 2008. In 2017, I had two-year-old twins and a six-year-old. We were living in Tampa with no family around. The business was basically year after year doubling, which was nuts and so exciting, but also exhausting. Nuts. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Two years years prior, we had exhibited at the National Stationery Show in New York, and we won Best New Product with a Simplified Planner which was amazing, but put a lot of eyes on us media wise and also with retail stores. And we had gone, we had such a great business online, but we had gone retail, you know, into boutiques and things like that because we heard that's what you're supposed to do. So we were in 800 stores around the world and it sounded really great to say like, yeah, but what it looked like logistically was me on an airplane all the time. And it was exhausting. And there was this one day where I had been reading this book by Shauna Nequist, Present Over Perfect. And she tells this story that I hope I don't butcher it because it's her beautiful story. But she tells this story about two pastors. They're talking and one is a pastor, an older pastor of a good sized, medium sized church who's been doing this forever. One is a young pastor of a quickly growing like mega church. Right. And they're just talking about their congregations and growth and whatnot. And the young pastor is saying, it just keeps growing. Like we just keep growing and growing and growing. And every Sunday there's like tons more people there. And I don't even, I don't even know how we, how this happened. And the older pastor looked at him and he said, yes, you do. You kept putting out the chairs. And I read that and I was just like, oh, like, okay. I know why I'm exhausted. Cause I keep saying, yes, I keep putting out the chair. I have goosebumps just telling the story. And <laughs> I was laying on my bed. The kids are asleep and I was just sobbing. And my husband comes in and he's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, the chairs, the chairs. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So long story short, I knew in my gut that wholesale was the problem, that our team wasn't big enough to manage it, that I didn't start the company to to like communicate with retailers. I started it to make an impact for women who were really busy and trying to focus on what matters most to them. And I couldn't do that when I had a retailer between me and the customer. 
Cutting our wholesale program was the obvious choice, but it meant cutting 40% of our revenue, which was so scary. So my finance minded husband and I sat down and made a million spreadsheets and figured out that we could cut wholesale, keep all of our employees. And then it's kind of like that 80, 20 rule of, you know, 80% of your revenue is coming from 20% of your people. Yes. We could focus all that time that we were spending on wholesale, so much time, and we could focus it on this like hyper productive group of women that were just like thirsty for community and interaction and more products. And, and we could focus on growing that and bringing more women to that table. And in our head, in my gut, it was going to work, right? And the next year, we doubled again. Wow. We, didn't, we did not miss a beat with uh, cutting wholesale. I mean, it was, it was just the biggest confirmation of like, stay the course and keep your eye on what's most important. Because when you get distracted and you start saying yes to things because you think it's what you're supposed to do, it never really ends up turning out well. Oh my goodness. That is so amazing. Yeah. It is so amazing. So I'm excited to see what's coming out of a uh, rebrand for you too. Oh yeah. <laughs> we were just looking we have a new website coming out, some new messaging and I think it's going to come out tentatively late May, but we have a new social good program. It's called Simplified Social Good, and a portion of our proceeds are going to go to women and girls in need um, through a lot of different organizations. So that's been so fun to work on, something I'm super passionate about and excited to get to get working on this year. That's a huge legacy play too. You know, it's yeah. like really doing the things that I mean, not that everything that you've been doing has mattered, but really it's like you make so much money to then really be generous and give back and, and help people. So I love that you're leading the way in that for women too. Thank you. You just did an episode about when you reach your what's next moment. Yeah. You talk about turning 40 and just so many of the things you dreamed about, you know, when you were 25 have happened now. Yeah. And it's funny. I, I just had that moment like in this last year as well, where it's like, okay, yeah, yeah what is next? So I really related to this episode <laughs> a yeah. lot. What advice would you give to women who have accomplished, you know, the goals that they've set out to accomplish and now they're asking, what's next? I think it's kind of like that, that old saying about like, if you keep doing the same things, you're going to keep getting the same results. Like I felt really stuck going into my sabbatical. I felt like, you know, there weren't a lot of options. Like I have this fantastic company. I'm not leaving it. I'm not selling it. Like I, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, but like, how do I get back to that place where I'm super fired up about what I'm doing and I'm really passionate about it. And I think it just took me getting really still and doing some like deep thinking about what's next. And also pushing myself out of my comfort zone in a couple of different ways. Like I started taking piano lessons, which I've never done in my life. I didn't know how to read music. Like, I mean, I I had no clue what I was doing. And doing that kind of a thing, like sitting down with a piano teacher and being terrible at it and like trying and listening and learning, it like unlocks this creativity that it feels like it's been kind of dormant for a while, you know? So I would say step outside your comfort zone a little bit. You never know what you'll unlock that way. I mean, I don't know that I'm going to go on to be like a concert, you know, pianist, but it is fun. And my, one of my sons is now into it. And I think that it also just reminded me that like, I'm not done. I'm, I'm, I've done things and it's been awesome. And, and there's so much, there's so much more that we can do. And I think part of this social good, the simplified social good program is also something that just like, it connects me to what we're doing in a way that feels really important and meaningful. And long lasting. So it makes me excited to really like give myself to it. I also realized while I was out, I was a blogger. Like I started out with, I was blogging about the company and like the behind the scenes because there was starting your own business in 2008 was kind of like a new thing. And I had to give that up because we got so busy. So I started a Substack, which is like a new platform. I don't know if it's new, but it's new to me a new platform where writers can produce content that people can pay to subscribe to. And I thought if I do it this way, I'm able to, I'd be able to carve out real time for it as a, you know, a revenue producing thing. 
And it has been such a fun creative outlet. And it took off like crazy. I've only had it up like two weeks, but it's been so fun to write in a way that is not being sent off to a publisher, you know? Mm-hmm. Like you're, yeah, you're not getting graded on it. <laughs> I'm not getting a graded on it or edited. So it might, I might spell things wrong. You just never know. <laughs> oh, I love that. How exciting. I'll have to go check it out and subscribe. So, you know, you're an ambitious woman. I'm an ambitious woman. And I hear all the time, when is it going to be enough? And I'm always like, it's never like, I'm always like yeah. wanting to see the challenge. It's funny that you're doing piano lessons. I started doing piano lessons like six months ago, oh, every awesome. Wednesday. Yeah. Because it was just something to, I was like, I need to get that creative part of my brain yeah. going. And I am absolutely obsessed with it. Like I, when I have a free five minutes, I go in there and I'm practicing. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so I love that we have that in common, but you know, do you hear that question a lot? Like when will it be enough? I ask myself that sometimes, you know, I was telling my husband recently, I feel like if Simplified could keep doing what it's doing now and we could, you know, keep going and making an impact the way we are and have these same 10 amazing women. Wow. Like, that's awesome. I have the flexibility and they do too. Like we all have the flexibility to be at our kids, you know, play at school or like volunteer for a field trip or like, take an afternoon off because we're going to hang out, you know, go to lunch with friends or whatever. Like doing that, having that lifestyle to me, like that's everything. And that's awesome. And so when I lose that, when I am too busy to go have lunch with a friend or to go volunteer at my kid's school, that's when I know something's off and I'm, I'm after the wrong thing. I've got my eye on the wrong statistic or the wrong data. And, um, I kind of pull myself back to like, why did you start this in the first place? And the answer to that was because I just wanted to have flexibility as a mom. That was it. So it's like, it's having that self-awareness to know mm-hmm. like, what is it that I really want? And making right. sure that you're, you're staying true to that. Yeah. Instead of going, at, you know, what, what your publisher wants, what yeah. maybe some people on your team want, you know, yep. but staying true to you. I think that's amazing. All right. So to wrap this up, I really want to dig deep like into your faith because Mm -hmm. like some of the things that I've gone through in business, I think like I couldn't have gone through that. I don't know what people have like without faith, how they Mm -hmm. get through it. Cause I'd have thrown in the towel like a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, So what are some things that like, you know, you feel that God has like destined you to be a business owner for such a time as this? Like how has your faith like made you really believe that? I I feel like there's like little God winks along the way, you know, like things, the stars align in certain ways. Hearing from people that read my books, particularly my first book, Grace Not Perfection, I wrote it as a very overwhelmed new mom who was trying very hard to keep up the image of having it all together because I felt like everyone else did. And I was the only one who was struggling. So hearing from people who have read my words or are using our products and like, they feel seen and they know that they're not alone and that life is hard and it's actually hard for all of us. <laughs> that to me is like God saying like, see, it matters. Keep going. What's your favorite Bible verse? Mm, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I'm God. Because my grandmother used to always say, Emily, <laughs> be still, because I was constantly moving. And that was just a special verse that she would say to me often and remind me to just when I, when I like to think that I can like outwork a problem, sometimes she's like, so maybe you just need to be still and listen. So I love that one. Awesome. All right. Well, I know that my listeners are going to want to follow you now that you're back from sabbatical. So where can everybody find you? Yeah, I'm on social media as Emily Lay, L-E-Y, and also Simplified. And then we have our online store at emilylay.com and I'm emilylay.substack over there. Okay, we're going to make sure to link everything up in the show notes so you awesome. all can check it out. Make sure to take a screenshot of this episode and tag us both. Tell us what you learned or were inspired by from Emily, you know, sharing her story. I Emily, thank you so much for being on the podcast and just being that woman of faith that's also ambitious and in business because you're leading the way for so many women to come behind you and, you know, you've blazed the trail for so many. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on.